Good afternoon and welcome to the Said Business School. My name is Colin Mayer. I'm a professor of management studies here at the Said Business School at the University of Oxford. And I'm going to be talking to you this afternoon about a book that I've just written entitled Firm Commitment, Why the Corporation is Failing Us and How to Restore Trust in It. We've recently endured a multiplicity of problems. Tech bubble crisis at the beginning of the last decade, the accounting scandals, the financial crises of 2008, the LIBOR scandal, the Gulf of Mexico disaster, and Fukushima in Japan. And each of those is viewed as having a specific underlying cause speculative markets in the tech bubble crisis, corporate governance problems in the accounting scandals, deregulation in the financial crisis, mismanagement of markets in the LIBOR scandal, internal controls in the Gulf of Mexico, and crony capitalism in the case of Fukushima. And each is regarded as requiring a particular solution. Improved disclosure, stronger corporate governance, tougher financial regulation, public rather than self-regulation, strengthened internal controls, better management of public utilities. I'm going to argue that the problems are not specific and the solutions are not individual. There's a generic cause and a common response is required. The generic problem is the corporation and the common solution is to fix it and not everything else around it. Underlying the problem is a misconception of the nature of the corporation. It's variously regarded as a production function linking inputs to the outputs of the firm, as a transaction cost saving device for reducing the costs of transacting in the markets, and as a nexus of contracts bringing together suppliers, purchasers, and employees. It exists for the benefit of its owners, its shareholders, and directors owe a particular responsibility to further their interests. That promotes economic efficiency, and through corporate reputations, it promotes the broader interests of society as well. Where there are conflicts, they're corrected through private litigation and public regulation. Where broader social considerations arise, then private companies cannot address them. The state enters to fill the gap left by the private sector. This combination of shareholder interests, contracts, reputation, regulation and state engagement underpins the structure of economies around the world. It's the basis of national and international policies of domestic and global public institutions. When markets fail, we need more regulation and state engagement. Where state organizations malfunction, then privatization and more liberal markets are required. This economic and political consensus emerged progressively towards the end of the 20th century and is now widely accepted. But I will suggest it's fundamentally wrong. Equally misconceived is the alternative, unconventional paradigm that advocates a private sector approach to the problem, corporate social responsibility, social entrepreneurship, and stakeholder values. These see the fundamental problem as, as lying with companies and markets and a need to reposition both to broader social agenda. Where they fail is in establishing any credible criteria by which these objectives can be delivered and in ensuring that the worthy goals of the social entrepreneurs and socially responsible businesses are our goals as communities, the public, and consumers. 
the failures of the conventional and unconventional paradigms is in providing a compelling description of the corporation. The nature of the corporation does not derive from simple relations of inputs to outputs or lower costs of transacting within than outside the corporation or from acting as a legal device for contracting with various parties. First and foremost, its objective is not to its shareholders or to its stakeholders. It is to make, develop and deliver things and to service people, communities and nations. And it does this through engaging investors, creditors as well as shareholders and stakeholders, employers, suppliers and communities. And in the process, it balances the commitments it makes and the control it exerts over them, and it assumes a variety of forms to achieve this, of which the traditional model of the company, the shareholder-oriented corporation, is one but only one manifestation. It's neither universally right nor universally wrong, and in presuming that it is one or the other, public policy has made serious errors. The emphasis of legal theories of the corporation is on contracts, property and agency. The design and enforcement of contracts, the rights that derive from the holding of property and relations of agents, the executives of firms, to their principles, the shareholders. The focus of economics and finance has been on contracts, incentives and control. Neither legal theory nor economics have devoted the same attention to the corresponding problems of non-contracted parties, relations and commitment. And that is the focus of my book. Limitations on contractual claims, restraints on the exercise of property rights and the fiduciary responsibilities of corporations to third parties the stakeholders. Conventional concerns are with incentives, ownership and control. Those of this book are with obligations, responsibilities and commitment. The strength of the corporation derives from its ability to combine and balance the traditional perspective on incentives, ownership and control with this alternative view of obligations, responsibilities and commitment. And it can do this on account of its distinguishing feature, and that is the separation between the ownership and control of the corporation. From a conventional perspective, that separation is a problem, exacerbating deficiencies of contracts, property and agency, and accentuating the need for incentives, ownership and control. In this context, it's an attribute, facilitating the recognition and provision of obligations, responsibilities and commitment. Conventionally, the firm is regarded as a control device, allowing it to substitute internal controls and incentives where market processes and prices fail. In this context, it's a commitment device, allowing it to uphold relations between different parties that cannot otherwise be credibly sustained. Its strength derives from its ability to combine the control and commitment functions to degrees that vary over activity, location and time. But this balance has been undermined by one particular interest group, and that is the shareholders of the corporation. The fiduciary responsibility of directors is to the owners. Corporate law confers rights and obligations on directors to take account of the interest of others, but these are derivative, not fundamental. They derive from the interests of shareholders in the sense that directors can and should uphold the interests of employees and suppliers to the extent that it is of benefit to shareholders, but no more, and to do so would be to act beyond the powers of the director. What lies behind this is the view that shareholders 
are in a special relation with their companies. Unlike other parties, they are not protected by contract. They have no claims on the earnings that they can enforce by contract. They are residual claimants. Furthermore, their capital is permanent and cannot, like other forms of investment, be withdrawn. Such, they are unusually exposed and therefore need special protection of which the fiduciary responsibilities of directors of loyalty, honesty, and care are important. But this distinction between contractual and non-contractual claims is a false one, because firstly, many other parties are also not but protected by, or very imperfectly protected by contract, of which employees, in particular in developing countries, are a good example. And secondly, the enforceability of contracts even on debt, where there are good covenants and collateral, are in practice weak. Nor is equity actually a permanent form of capital. And the explanation for that is the reason why the crisis in the corporation has become so acute today. Corporations were originally established by royal or public charter to fulfill a public purpose, to facilitate the voyages of discovery around the world, the establishment of trading companies, to build railroads and canals. With the freedom of incorporation in the 19th century, there was a separation between this public purpose and a private purpose. But at that stage, firms were still owned by families that had defined purposes and a long-term horizon. But there was a problem. How could families finance the growth of their companies beyond the amounts of money that they were generating internally within their firms? In many countries, they did this through bank finance. But what in Britain was once the world's finest banking system for funding enterprise and the source of Britain's claim to be the workshop of the world at the beginning of the 19th century became the worst banking system by the beginning of the 20th century. The cause was the eradication of local banking in Britain, promoted by a Bank of England concerned more about the systemic instability of a large number of small banks exposed to the fl fluctuations of their local markets than to the funding needs of the industries they were supposed to service. The solution was to encourage a consolidation amongst the banks and their concentration in London. Bank crises were indeed eradicated for the next 100 years, and there were no failures of banks in Britain until 2008. But so too was the financing of industry eradicated in the process. Instead, companies had to turn to equity markets rather than banks to finance their growth, and the result was that family ownership was rapidly extinguished and replaced by dispersed ownership. The consequence was the problem of the separation of ownership and control and the problem of agency between the shareholders and the managers. The response was the emergence of institutional control in place of individual owners, the emergence of markets in corporate control, takeovers, leverage deal, shareholder activism, and the withdrawal of public to private firms. In the process, firms have become fixated on one issue, their shareholder returns. Distributions to shareholders in the form of dividends are maximized, and external new equity issues are minimized. In fact, in both the United Kingdom and the United States, the amount of money that companies raise from shareholders is negative, and they pay out more than they raise from their shareholders. So actually, not only can shareholders exit at will through liquid stock markets, but total equity capital is not actually permanent either. It's regularly extracted, in particular, in acquisitions paid for by cash. We've therefore steadily moved from corporations with a public, national, 
interest and purpose, to private firms with long-term concentrated shareholders, to firms that are subject to active governance by dispersed anonymous shareholders who withdraw as much capital as fast as they possibly can. The purpose of the corporation has therefore changed dramatically from a public one to a narrowly defined focus on shareholder returns and very short-term shareholder returns. And increasingly, we are trying to control the body of the whale by tickling its tail. But there's a further feature of that shift to shareholder returns as the sole concern of the corporation. Seventy years ago, the average holding period of those shareholders was some eight years. Thirty years ago, it was four years. Now, the average holding period of a shareholder in a company is a matter of a few months. The decline is not primarily due to the shortening of holdings by institutional shareholders, pension funds and life insurance companies. They have similar holdings to what they had 70 years ago. It's the rise of hedge funds and high-frequency traders that trade their shares in a matter of months, days, seconds or nanoseconds that has dramatically reduced the average holding period. Ownership is increasingly concentrated in shareholders that have no interest in returns beyond the next few days or indeed the next few seconds. It's as if we're conferring voting rights on the running of our companies on nationals who intend to relinquish their citizenship to tomorrow. The consequence is that the focus of economic and legal theory is on the wrong problem. The problem of dispersed ownership that was identified was a lack of accountability of management to their shareholders. Dispersed shareholders did not have enough incentives to monitor and control their management, and management was given too much of a free reign to pursue their own interests to the detriment of their investors. The results are outrageous managerial pay, no relation of pay to performance, managerial entrenchment and waste. We need tougher corporate governance, more shareholder activism, more regulation. And the vast majority of policy over the past few decades has been directed to this one issue. Sarbanes-Oxley in the US, Dodd-Frank in the US, Cadbury in the UK, and in various European Commission directors. But this problem is a non-problem. It's been solved. The problem of the financial crisis was not of insufficiently high-powered managerial incentives. It was of too high-powered incentives. The banks that failed were the ones with the highest powered incentives on their management. The problem is not one of more accountability to shareholders. The banks with the best corporate governance, independent directors, separate chairmen and CEOs, though, were the ones that performed the worst. 20 years of strengthening corporate governance by legislation, regulation, exhortation and standard setting has delivered worse, not better corporate performance. The problem is that we're focused on the wrong problem. The common cause of the TATCOM bubble, the accounting scandals, the financial crisis, the LIBOR scandal was not a problem of agency, it was a very different problem. It was a problem of default. Fraud is rampant. It's not necessarily the fraud that we associate with people like Bernie Madoff, but a much more subtle form of fraud. It's what we're educating all of our students to do, to make money. There are two ways to make money. The first is to make good or goods. The second is to engage in wealth transfer. By wealth transfer, I mean making money at the expense of others. Economics tells us that there's a coincidence between wealth creation and wealth transfer. Or at least we can de de design incentives to make them consistent. Unfortunately, there isn't. And the vast proportion of what goes on is of the second type, wealth transfer, 
not wealth creation. Why? Simply because it's much simpler to steal than to produce. And Britain, in particular, has become the archetypal example of that because it produces little and it steals brilliantly. In fact, we're becoming the global centre for legalised theft. It's called financial markets. I could give numerous examples, but I'll cite just one that comes from a student here in, a, in the business school whose thesis I had the pleasure of examining recently. It's about hedge funds and the way in which hedge funds conduct their business. It's a very careful analysis of how they reward themselves through the fees they charge, how they measure and report their performance, and how they record their assets under management. What he finds is that fees bear little or no relation to subsequent performance, what he terms money for nothing, and fund managers systematically manipulate and restate their performance measures and disguise changes in the value of their assets under management that might prompt a rush of withdrawals of investments. Surprising? Not a bit of it. Nor were the systematic misreportings of trades on LIBOR or the accounting manipulations or the inflated sales of valueless tax stocks. And there's very good reason why these are not surprising. That is what we are all precisely incentivized to do. It was 1.30 p.m. on one Wednesday the 27th of June. Suddenly, up on Reuters and the ticker tapes flashed the announcement that the UK and US regulatory authorities had reached a settlement with Barclays Bank in their investigation into the supposed misrepresentation of lending rates on the London Interbank Offered Rate libel. Between 1.30 and 4.30 p.m. when the London stock markets closed, Barclays' share price steadily rose. The stock market was overjoyed to hear the news. At least it was until the following day when the Prime Minister of Britain, David Cameron, stood up in Parliament and denounced Barclays Bank and was followed by every politician and press commentator crying for criminal investigations, sackings and the breakup banks. What is more worrying is that the Barclays share price response is not unrepresentative. As a doctoral student of mine here in the business school has documented, it always happens, or at least share prices fail to fall, when financial institutions are revealed to have engaged in market manipulations or money laundering. It's invariably observed when companies have been found to breach environmental regulations, unless firms hurt their own customers or investors. If they do things that hurt others, the stock market rejoices. And so it should, because their firms are engaging in activities that benefit them at the expense of others. Wealth transfer. Unless, of course, the public rea reaction is so damning, as it eventually was in the case of Barclays or BP, in the Gulf of Mexico to impact negatively on the earnings of the firm itself. The market therefore systematically encourages wealth transfer and by strengthening corporate governance and the relation of pay to performance we are reinforcing the incentives on, it, on management to engage in it. That is why the financial institutions with the strongest incentives and the best corporate governance standards performed the worst in the financial crisis. They were the ones for whom shareholder interests were paramount. And tickling the tail of the whale is not only ineffective in controlling the whale, it causes it to go into a state of uncontrollable and ultimately fatal spasms. Wealth transfers are in unpleasant for the losers but equally rewarding for the recipients. So we might believe that they are not the most serious economic issue of the day. But they are. Default, wealth transfers or fraud are the cause of British economic decline, the rise and fall of the Japanese economy, 
The dominance and now virtual demise, terminal demise of the US economy and virtually other, every other example of the wealth and impoverishment of nations. Now that's a slightly bold assertion, so I'm not going to even attempt to justify it now. I'm going to merely give one illustration of it, which is close to home. The wealth transfers that underpin much financial activity have had two significant consequences. First of all, those of, who engage in them are over-rewarded. Increasingly, for example, the landed estates of Britain are being transferred to investment bankers, private equity, and hedge fund managers. Secondly, those who do not engage in them are exposed to those who do. Some things such as manufacturing, unfortunately, have to rely on doing things, which require the investment of time, capital, and training. During the process, they're exposed to the smart-eyed financiers appreciating the vulnerability of those making those investments by reallocating them to those who don't. Wealth transfer. Of course, the managers, employees, suppliers, and creditors who are making these investments attempt to protect themselves as best they can through contracts, but invariably they cannot. But they have one other solution available to them they don't invest in the first place. So far from being economically neutral in their effects, wealth transfers are devastating for resource allocations in the economy. They encourage a systematic overinvestment in wealth transfer activities and a systematic underinvestment in wealth creation, which is exposed to wealth transfer. And that is, of course, why the best and brightest of our graduates seek careers in wealth transfer rather than wealth creation. Only the naive and the nerds believe in creation. But this all pales into insignificance in comparison to the group that is most exposed to this type of wealth transfer, including the whale itself. When in 1920, Charles Ponzi lured investors into a scheme that offered investors high returns. He was doing so on the back of cash subscribed by other investors. This form of using investments, now known as Ponzi schemes, operate by paying returns to some people from the investment of others. And it's what lies behind virtually all fraudulent schemes. Ponzi's ingenuity came from appreciating that this is best done by rewarding current generations of subscribers from the cash that future generations will provide, a chain letter or pyramid system. Likewise, the most significant sources of wealth are in general created not by stealing from existing, but from future investors, and doing so in a form that no one will notice. Sophisticated financial instruments offer unlimited opportunities for doing this. In my book, I describe a model based on a paper by Dean Foster and Peyton Young, in which I describe how, with almost certainty, you can earn enough to buy a country estate within five years. In essence, it relies on the long tail of distributions. Financial instruments that offer small but steady returns with high probability against a small probability of devastating losses. The smart Ponzi, hedge fund, and investment brokers pass on the steady returns that they've enjoyed on these schemes and instruments over several years just before they explode in the face of their unsuspecting successes. What is happening in each case is that inadequate provision is being made for the small probability of the large losses and its future generations of investors. In the Madoff case, communities and species, in the case of the Gulf of Mexico and Fukushima, and taxpayers, as well as investors in the banks involved in the financial crisis that pay the price. We are systematically stacking up the pyrotechnics of unexploded future liabilities below an illusory pile of wealth creation. 
If sufficient capital was set aside by those writing these contracts and engaging in these activities, then of course their attraction would rapidly evaporate. The capital then that they had at risk would match the gains that they had earned from pure wealth transfer, and only wealth creation, not wealth transfer, would be profitable. And this suggests some of the required solutions. They bear not only on the positive aspects of corporate conduct, what the corporation could do, but also on the normative ones, what the corporation should do. While principles of morality are well developed in relation to individuals, they are not in respect of corporations. Indeed, the idea of a moral corporation would generally be regarded as an oxymoron. What gives substance to commitment is the volume of committed capital, a product of the amount of capital invested in the corporation, the breadth of commitment to different parties, and the length of time for which they are committed. It's the commitment of capital by shareholders that discourages the violation of the trust of other parties. Two companies that illustrate this particularly well are Lehman Brothers and Barclays Bank. They illustrate the principle of the moral corporation very clearly. But it's not the Lehman Brothers and Barclays Bank of today, not their 21st century version, but their 19th and 17th century versions, respectively. Mayor Lehman, the founder of Lehman Brothers, instructed his children in the, true, in the Jewish tradition of tzedakah, charity, by taking them regularly every Sunday to the wards of the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York to see the plight of less fortunate members of society. The founder of Barclays Bank, John Freem, published scripture instruction, a textbook of morals that was used in Quaker schools for over a century. Over a period of two or three centuries, the breadth of principles of the founders of these banks has come to be reduced to the single value of maximizing the earnings of the now dispersed shareholders and the professional executives of their organization. And one of the causes of the demise of morality in corporations is that we've sought to substitute it with the morality of the state. In a recent survey of which professions people trusted the most, businessmen, politicians, and bankers came bottom. Alongside the clergy, doctors, and teachers, university professors came top. We might have no power, pay, or prestige, but at least people trust us to do nothing, earn nothing, and to take no credit for it. <laughs> Trust is clearly in short supply. Bankers are in the pits, but so too are businessmen, politicians, and regulators. The response of the collapse of trust has been one thing, regulation, a progressive extension of regulation to all walks of life and oversight of all our activities by other people. What is wrong with responding to financial crises with strength and regulation? Numerous things. For one thing, the horse has bolted. Those people who were lucky enough to escape before the crash have made their fortunes. Those who did not have suffered their losses. As one banker friend put it to me, this financial crisis has been worse than those terrible multi-million dollar divorce settlements. Not only have I lost half my wealth, but I still have my spouse. <laughs> Second, regulation frequently creates the problem it seeks to solve. The micromanagement of financial institutions can create the systemic risks it seeks to alleviate by introducing uniformity where there should be diversity. But there's a more fundamental problem with regulation. We associate regulation with the promotion of moral conduct. <clears throat> it prevents producers from abusing customers. It limits the extent to which firms can charge excessively high prices, and it encourages the delivery of high-quality services. In fact, it does exactly the opposite. It promotes immoral conduct. No one drives at 30 kilometers an hour in a built-up area. Everyone drives at no less than 33 kilometers, or whatever is the speed limit. 
at which, allowing for margins of error, they are likely to get caught. Penalising train companies for the late arrival of trains encourages them to trade off the penalties against the cost of ensuring punctuality. Forbidding the inclusion of certain harmful ingredients and products encourages the substitution of the cheapest permitted alternative. Regulation therefore leads to instrumental behaviour that far from enhancing moral conduct, which embraces the welfare of others, focuses our attention on the regulations themselves and ways in which we can circumvent or minimise their effects. Instead of worrying about the interests of pedestrians or cyclists, we stare at our speedometer. Instead of being concerned about the impact of delays on their customers, train companies are concerned with indices of punctuality. And food producers advertise the health benefits of excluding harmful ingredients that they are forced to disclose, not the detrimental impact of others. The futility of using regulation to promote moral conduct is illustrated by the response that it's had in the companies that it regulates. Corporations employ regulatory departments that are supposed to ensure compliance with regulatory rules and standards. They are, in fact, avoidance rather than compliance departments. They spend as much time trying to circumvent regulations as comply with them. Utilities such as water, electricity and gas companies employ regulation departments to negotiate with regulators about the charges that they can levy on customers and to minimise the impact of regulation on corporate profitability. The futility of plugging a leaking container that leaks and springs up leaks elsewhere is a reasonable one, but it's in this case deliberately punctured by highly paid compliance officers who go round trying to puncture the vehicle. It's therefore not surprising that bankers have rewarded themselves grossly for failure, that banks have brought themselves to the brink of financial collapse, that regulators have been negligent or complicit, that credit rating agencies have been deficient in identifying potential corporate failures, that accountants are compromised by the consultancy services that they provide to their firms that they audit, and that fund managers trade their clients' portfolios to no benefit except the large fees that they can earn themselves. We're encouraged to do this by a system that confuses rules with standards, compliance with compassion, and obedience with integrity. We are no more immoral than our predecessors, but our response to immorality has encouraged us to be so. And the more we try to plug the leaking vessel this way, the more immoral we become. The solution is not to promote more regulation as a substitute for declining morality, but to re-establish trust where trust has been extinguished. Since most aspects of relationships cannot be specified contractually, they rely on trust. Trust depends on commitments between the parties concerned. Where there is commitment and trust, then values which reflect the interests of stakeholders and the community at large can be credibly sustained. There's therefore a coincidence between the positive determinants of economic efficiency and the normative ones of social welfare, and the competitive advantage of nations depends on the moral fibre of its corporations. Trust requires commitment, and in an economic context it requires capital, a sufficient volume of capital which is the product of its breadth, depth and length of capital. Corporation can provide this through its ability to uphold the interests of stakeholders, to raise capital, and to commit it for the long term. But this has been progressively eroded as firms have faced increasing pressure to focus on the interests of one party, their shareholders, to the exclusion of others, to repay rather than raise more capital, and to pamper to the interests of their shortest term shareholders. But the forces that have pushed corporations in this direction are not irreversible and by no means observed to the same extent in all countries or companies. In the book, I describe a number of practical approaches that can be taken to ensure that corporations once again become organisations that we can trust. There are straightforward changes to the ownership 
governance and purpose of corporations that allow them to, to assume the role of trust firms again. Infusing ethics in enterprises, establishing firm commitment and restoring trust in corporations without relying on regulators or the state to supply them are some of the most pressing needs of our age. They are critical to economic efficiency as well as social welfare because the moral corporation is ultimately an economically efficient corporation.